second, uh, we have all the speakers present <laughs> in this room, which is nice. And Ted, this is not so much about the <coughs> present, but it's about the past and the future. So we're going to see how we're going to organize it. God West, first speaker. Um, he's from the University of South Australia. He researches widely on civil military relations and how it intersects with changing forms of national solidarity, including themes of commemoration and military to civilian position. He's currently co-president of the Research Committee on Sociological Theory in the International Sociological Association, and is the author of Re-Enchanting Nationalism, 2015, uh, editor of War Commemoration and Memory, 2017, and co-editor of the of Militarization and the Global Rise of Paramilitary Culture, 19, uh, uh, 2021. Just listen, please. Right, and I'll and I'll flog my most recent book. Uh, this came out a couple of weeks ago uh, as well here. Um, Thank you uh, to Danny, his colleagues, for the invitation. Thank you for all the wonderful presentations thus far. Um, you know, so so many of the discussions we've been having feed into you know what I'm talking about as well. But uh, in my own mind, at least, I'm, I I feel that what I'm going to put forward is kind of works between some of the different perspectives that's been talked about uh, and some of the debates uh, we've been having. And and one of the central characteristics of of my work is trying to uh, look at the mechanisms behind different levels of national solidarity. Okay? Now, I don't normally use, use the term national solidarity. I think I have in various parts, um, and I, you know, I agree with um, you know, Denny's point you know, in the framing of, of this workshop in relation to... You know, we talk too much sometimes about national ident identity, um, and at times when the assumption between the link between national identity and solidarity you know, uh, uh, might not be there, or what conditions under which you know, is it there, and it's not an automatic process of one uh, in relation to the other. I'm going to talk to you today around you know national solidarity, the differing levels, the condition for the differing levels of engagement with the nation in the, in the context of a case study, or you know, um, that I've been doing for over 20 years now that keeps draw, drawing me back into it, uh, which is. Commemoration and, and ritual at the World War One battle, Gallipoli battlefields in Western Turkey. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting. I'm, you know, we're here on this campus, and I'm talking about this because <coughs> the, the Gallipoli has been the for Australia. Gallipoli is um, ever since you know the battle in 1915. You know, it's been the premier um, uh, battle military engagement that's really framed, you know, um, social memory of war in Australia. Okay. <laughs> but, but many people say, why? Why does it have this enduring characteristic? You know, um, it was uh, a stalemate for, stalemate for nine months. It's known in military, you know, history circles as a, a complete failure that, you know, that, um, um, you know, a complete you know, military disaster. Uh, it was, you know, a, a loss after nine months, you know, there was a withdrawal, but it's had this, you know, enduring, Australia's had this enduring fascination with it, though there's been different levels, as I'll talk about. You know, and one of the other competing things we could, you know, that could take the place that we could be the most celebrated event, you know, is Bathsheba, very <laughs> close by, 40 kilometres away or so, uh, which is, it was a great victory, um, and one of the great, uh, one of the last great, you know, Cavalry charges, um, and again, Australia late in the, in the war, uh, also on the Western Front, you know, um, had some had some uh, uh, significant victories, you know, which were important in in um, um, turning turning you know the tide of, of the war um, and resulting in the you know contributing greatly to the victory of the Allies. But it's not these; it's the military defeat in 1915 at Gallipoli, um, which which has been the focus. Um, and the book I'm going to sort of draw from here is a, is a comparative study of Australia's commemoration on the battlefield as well as Turkey's commemoration. Okay. 
Um, and as Dan talked about earlier on, this is a kind of cultural sociology of apples and oranges, you know, to use, to use his framing. Two different cases, but in relation to the importance of travel as a form of commemoration, a uh, form of commemorative practice, symbolic practice, one of those that's embodied, we have very similar types of characteristics in two cases of Australia and Turkey, but also the two nations, dialogically, if you want to use that term, really influencing each other in how the past is remembered. Okay. So I won't bore you with theory, but this is kind of where, you know, the how I see the problem with you know, nationalism, national identity, uh, literature, as it relates to national solidarity. Okay, that you know, for a lot of the you know, 20th century, the debate between uh, instrumentalists and primordialist perspectives, from, from the question of national solidarity, both have assumed it. Both have assumed strong connections to the nation. It was just a matter of you know, how those connections were formed, whether it was you know, from a Marxist perspective and the role of of organisations in the state, you know, was it invented, uh, or you know, was it you know more natural, was it more you know bottom up, and so forth. But they, it was the, the the high level of engagement, high levels of national solidarity was assumed. You know, the rise of post-industrialism, post-modernism, has all questioned that. Um, and out of that, really, you know, we have this emergence of everyday nationalism, which we, which we've heard you know a lot about. But the problem from my perspective and from the kind of neo durkheimian cultural sociology that I come from is that that's too much, for me, it's often too much seen as, oh, this is just a vestige, a leftover, an enduring relic of what came before. Okay? From my understanding of, of, of ritual and symbolic processes, you know, what's often considered you know, everyday nationalism, consumerism, tourism, travel, they can have that process. They can simply endure. They can be part of a process where you know where the national identification is just going to wither away in a, in a you know a more globally interconnected world. But from my perspective, you know, nationalism is a core component of modernity. It's a core component of, of capitalism. Just like capitalism, it reinvents itself, and it has been an enduring characteristic, and will likely be for some time in the lack of a cult, you know uh, functional alternative to it. But it's also one in which, where these, you know, um, kind of objects of everyday nationalism can also see, you know, a um, uh, 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 change history. Okay, they can you know, dramatically change structural processes, levels of engagement, and how the nation as a whole is understood, the narrative and the national identity, and that's what I think we see in Australia and Turkey here. And that's my, my argument. Okay? Not just as the, that it continues the national as a cultural frame that remains meaningful at some level. You know, we see you know, history, society changing, national identity in the way you understand yourself as a Turk or as an Australian because of what happens in relation to commemoration on the battlefields. <coughs> okay, and, we, and the other thing is the kind of performance uh, type uh, perspectives which we've talked about. But... The nation's often not referenced there, and is all these debates we've been having, is it national or is it civic? Right? So, you know, Jeff Alexander's work in relation to the civil sphere would be here where he doesn't talk about the nation, but the nation's often a unit within broader theories. Okay, so I'm drawing on uh, here uh, mostly this Finding Glipley book, which is a couple of uh, weeks old, and I still haven't got a paper copy in my, my hands yet. Um, uh, but also I'm drawing on this uh, book, um, Reenchanting Nationalisms. Uh, and my focus here is on not different types of nationalism, not the type of, and I've done this myself, um, you know, um, insert here nationalism, you know, COVID nationalism, um, event, um, I forget Michael's term that he talked about, you know, all these multiple different sorts of nationalisms, you know, the question is when do you just say, this is nationalism? Nationalism is an enduring characteristic of contemporary society. Um, and, but in that book I talk about different genres, commemorative genres, okay, and that they are affording different meanings. Okay, and again, it's not an automatic process, it's a, it's a performative one. Um, and I talk about human, you know, again, I do it myself, humanitarian nationalism is a type of commemorative genre during times of, of international uh, disaster and so forth. But, you know, pilgrimage and travel is also, you know, a type of genre 
in relation to national commemoration. And it's one that's distinctive from others. It's distinctive from you know, traditional, um, other forms of uh, traditional state-based um, commemorative practice. It's different from the kind of um, type that Hiskey was talking about in relation to barbecues and so forth. And each of these involve different actors. And because they involve different actors and different embodied experiences, there's different levels of traction of them, but they also afford different meanings and different interpretation of the past and as consequence of national identity. What's the genre? Yeah. Genre? Yeah. Um, so genre in terms of... Um, genre. Ah, genre. 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 <laughs> okay. Genre. Genre. Sorry. You just said it in English. He's Australian. Yes. Yes. Sorry, my... Uh, <laughs> Don't know. Um, oh, this is genre. 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 Different genre. Genres of commemoration. Okay. Um, so travel's a, p a particular genre of, um, you know, but it works and it's significant because travel has been a core part of national history, national mythology. Okay. And war um, you know, is just one case of this where we see you know, the movement of people being intertwined with national mythology. But that travel and the national mythology of the past is often in tension with uh, Com traditional state commemorative practice, which is, has a kind of immobile you know, uh, characteristic to it. Yet the key characteristic of travel is of, of witnessing, you know, having an embodied experience and seeing for yourself and you know, being there, you know, standing on the hallowed ground. And, and that um, brings with it you know, a certain sense of authenticity, you know, and one that's you know, isn't one that I think only becomes more important, or certainly retains its significance in a you know, digital media age. You know, one that um, and and Monty might you know, disagree with me, but you know, the one that's not going to be replaced by virtual reality. Okay. Um, but these practices are just of, is, are disruptive. You know. Imagining something at the distance is different from the embodied experience of being there. So they're disruptive, they challenge existing social memories of the past, but they also afford, we use kind of a media, provide an affordance um, or ways of remembering the past in different ways. You know, particularly because there's this heightened emotional experience and a strong sense of authenticity of being there. Okay. And tourism and travel often involve social actors and groups that aren't part of state-based traditional commemoration. Okay, so let's see how this plays itself out in the two cases of Australia and Turkey. Okay, so in Western nations, the late 19th century is broadly seen as um, the heyday of travel, international travel, and travel writing, okay. a, a celebration of, of, of mobility. Okay. It actually, you know, World War One is where it declines after that, and there was a freedom of travel. And for example, you know, passports in Europe <coughs> only really come in after World War One, and as a consequence of World War One and a new sort of national identification that comes with it, and and. On the battlefields, Australia built these wonderful grand memorials, often with some with religious iconography, assuming there would be pilgrimage traditions there by Australians. And there's all sorts of quotes uh, around that. Though no one will see partly why because of Turkey's engagement with the battlefields, but no one en masse travelled there until 1990. The battlefields were shut off as a military zone. Um, and where there were some pilgrimages, some one organised where veterans returned for the 50th anniversary in 1965, they're largely failures. I haven't got time to go into why, but they're performative failures. Um, though in, it was the decline of the Anzac Australian New Zealand Army Corps tradition, this national tradition, that provoked a return there. In 1990, the 
the Labor federal government in Australia, organised for veterans to... to, to um, the main memorial event was in Turkey, not Australia. And that was because of the, largely the, the very conservative veteran group that the government gave control of our main national memorial day uh, in the 1920s was, was of a certain orthodox nature of um, socially conservative, um, militarised the, the day in a way that you know, didn't allow to have a civic character in which you know, that everyone could see themselves through <coughs> the prism of Anzac and Gallipoli. It was the, these, these certain groups of veterans, and only some veterans, you know, were the heroic ideals, and the rest of you just you know, defer to them. Right? It wasn't serving the political purposes for nation building. And in fact, during the 1980s, there was a huge wave of new nationalism in Australia. Um, the, the Mel Gibson film Gallipoli, which some people may know, mm -hmm. was part of that, a re-engagement with military history, but this didn't translate to participation and a sense of cultural deference for the main Memorial Day of Anzac Day. Okay? Numbers and participation remained low. Okay? So the government really, you know, engaged in this pilgrimage, promoted pilgrimage, to you know, offshore it in a way to marginalise the Return Services League, this conservative veterans group. But, okay. Um, but what also came from that was uh, it became popular for young Australians to also visit the battlefields. And that 75th anniversary had built new memorials, um, which also provided a more contemporary uh, interpretation of the battle. Um, and were much more cosmopolitan one. Okay. Uh, there was memorials and a kind of a, a, a digging out of this quote from Ataturk, which uh, there's been a lot of controversy about its historical authenticity and, and translation of this, um, but where he talks about uh, the allies being buried um, and then you know, being treated like Turks where they lay. It's, huge, you know, it's one of the most popular places for the backpackers to visit, and ever since, you know, um, 1990, every Anzac Day, this is quoted. You have these memorials here where the, the Mamek uh, took his shoulders carrying a, a, a wounded allied uh, captain. And again, the, the story of that's taken from um, the diaries of someone, a soldier who became the Governor General of Australia. Though actually, if you look at those diaries, this <laughs> account doesn't exist at all, right? So you talk about imagined, this is imagined. <laughs> okay. For Turkey, okay, part of the reason Australians didn't go there, that, you know, Turkey, uh, following formation of modern Turkey, um, again, travel <coughs> is very, you know, very important in Islamic history, you know, associated with ideas of truth, authenticity, is a core part of the romance of travel was core, core part in the 15th, 16th century of the rise of the Ottoman, expansion of the Ottoman Empire, and also travel uh, was part of the modernisation movement within uh, uh, Islam uh, as well, where this travel genre um, uh, saw, started to account for Muslims travelling within Europe. Okay. Um, with the formation of modern Turkey, um, you know, they clamp down on pilgrimage generally as a genre, okay, but also this being Ottoman history, not Turkish history, okay, they didn't want, you know, people visiting the battlefields because they didn't want that sentimentality uh, of uh, Islam and, you know, Ottoman uh, religious traditions. However, in the 1990s and not, well, 1980s and 1990s, when the Republican project was failing, um, and a lot of sectarian and violence, sectarian violence and so forth, uh, you know, where Ataturk's you know, charisma only ran so far following his death. You know, they drew on pilgrimage and they drew on allowing people to, to, as a genre to try to rejuvenate the Republican project and, and Gallipoli was sanctioned because Ataturk fought there. Okay? And then you know, they had various statues, new memorials formed, you know, they, they, they jumped on board with the Australians in terms of that kind of cosmopolitan dialogical memorial project um, and it was also part of trying to get into the uh, EU and, and repair its <coughs> militaristic um, um, reputation. 
2002, though, AKP, Justice and Development Party, um, you know, led by, um, uh, largely led by, uh, recap Erdogan, you know, gets in. Uh, these things change, right? He, he starts to push the Ottoman history and becomes a, a, an important part of a broader re-engagement that's happening in Turkey uh, with Ottoman history. Okay. Part of a desecularization movement, which isn't just isn't led by Gallipoli, but Gallipoli's been a really important part of it. The AKP, third one, you know, tried various occasions to establish a new um, commemorative tradition in Ottoman history, all largely failures, and the only success that they really had was with Gallipoli. Now, part of the success was is that it, it hasn't. They've only been so successful in that, and they've got a. They've had to what I call a sort of neo-Ottoman history has developed, where they've had to combine, which is really the first time in modern Turkish history, combine sort of secular traditions with Islamic ones, with Ottoman ones. Okay. So what you get, in, and what you have, because the the you know the republic came from the War of Independence, what you have in Turkey is an absence of a war memorial that we find in other, certainly Western nations. You know, they have the, the, the Ataturk as the founding president replaces, overcodes an independent war memorial tradition, war remembrance tradition, but you have the Gallipoli becomes a space where this actually happens and there's lots of flexibility and lots of kind of you know, there's an attraction to the, memori the, to the commemorative traditions themselves, including various forms of, of um, ritual. The 57th Regiment um, a memorial tradition uh, becomes more important. But you have this new Islamic coding, it's kind of called post-heroic coding, where you move away from Ataturk, which is the grand single hero, hero and you start this, the, the collective memory, social memory starts you know, more everyday heroes. Uh, here you can see uh, Corporal Sayit, who, you know, isn't new to the history of Gallipoli, but, you know, becomes much more prominent, overcodes that of Ataturk, where he was carrying this, you know, impossible shell uh, he apparently picked up and then uh, put it in the cannon, fired and sunk one of the British uh, ships in the naval campaign, which predated the... the uh, and so, you know, the Turks that are visiting the battlefields you know, that's largely now sponsored by the state. So people can travel to the battlefield from anywhere in Turkey for free as part of a sort of social tourism experiment. And prior to the centennial, this amounted to more than a million people in that one year. Um, you know, visiting Sayit's uh, memorial, not this one here, but a different one, you know, is the most emotional time that they, they have. Um, the mother. In, the, in these narration, because it's largely women who have very low labour uh, work participation rates in Turkey that's declined over the last 30 years. Uh, you can see here the, the, the grieving mother on the, on the left of the screen, your right of the screen. Um, in the narrations, they become heroes. And it's one that you know, celebrates loss rather than victory which was the previous Republican narration. And that feeds into all sorts of uh, Islamic politics. And so just finishing up. So from this brief you know, overview of, of what's been happening here, which is really led by ritual, the attraction of ritual, but also the, the, how those rituals afford certain meanings. Um, in the case of the backpackers, the backpackers, young Australians being come, becoming um, carriers and custodians of national memory, more so than these older traditional veterans or those you know contemporary um, those um, serving in the military currently. We have this kind of you know sense of national solidarity, and I've tried to provide a kind of uh, a definition um, of that. But I think it brings the context of national solidarity brings us to the question of the levels and types of engagement with the nation. And, and what are the conditions in which that changes? Which goes beyond the assumptions that it's just the nation is, you know, has this primordial, universal presence. Um, but also goes beyond the kind of uh, what I see is the everyday nationalism that always sees that, you know, it reinforces but never broadly elevates 
the nation as a core sort of symbolic frame for understanding you know, the world, uh, but also how it can drop out as well. So where does every, when does everyday nationalism fail? What are the mechanisms, mechanisms in which it doesn't work? When does perform, that performance fail? And I think you know, focus on national solidarity kind of makes us ask those questions, which I think we're not asking uh, sufficiently enough at the moment. So thank you. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Remarks? Please. Just thanks very much, very enjoyed. I was just wondering when you know when you compared uh, Gallipoli and then the other cases of defeat that we celebrated them in detail. Was thinking about possible uh, defeat. Uh, what's different here is this kind of focus on space. So you have to go and be. It's very far away from still It's very expensive. Obviously, people, as you mentioned previously, didn't do that, and, and it, it is linked with different things that you've explained. But it's important to be there. In a Kosovo case, it's not important. <laughs> you cannot even be there now. But even you know, for hundreds of years, there was not that sense that it's really necessary to make that pilgrimage because it, it's a sort of perceived as a spatial, you know, uh, t time thing that you just need to acknowledge and be aware and keep the tradition rather than kind of lock it and going to the Kosovo battlefield and doing something. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, why is that? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll respond to each one because I'm not talented enough to collect them yeah, and yeah, respond. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, part of it, and I go into in the book, you know, part of it's new travel sensibilities, the rise of, rise of post fortis tourism, um, and that's why, you know, um, and in a deference to the exotic, but you know, the contemporary travellers want the Turkish perspective. They're not going there to just to, to get the emotional experience of being there and being more Australian. And partly they're travelling there as a tourist, to Turkey as a tourist, and the ride and budget accommodation in, in Turkey and the tourism in Turkey and the popularity of travelling in Turkey you know, was often early on the main motivation, and then you'd go to Gallipoli. Um, but so it's, 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 it's a, the, con the contemporary cultural desire for such experiences is what <coughs> is the shift towards... Um, the rise and significance of the pilgrimage, where previously I think you know, apart from you know some grieving relatives that really wanted to see you know their son's grave, happy enough with the kind of long distance nationalism, happy enough with just imagining it, happy enough with the rituals in Australia. Um, so it's the failure of those rituals, and in Turkey's case, the failure of you know the secular republican ideology to fulfil people's um, need for meaning and identity is the decline of those, you know, national projects, decline of nation building, you know, which is both the search for new forms of meaning, but also the, the institutional desire to provide an alternative to rejuvenate, try to rejuvenate <coughs> these projects, but they, they also open up, up you know, alternative uh, why? I still wonder, let's say, I mean, to bring in the Israeli context, you know, Masada matters and it's important to go and make these things. So pilgrimage matters. Mm. Yeah. Like in, in the Serbian nationalism, Kosovo is really the number one thing. But it doesn't really have that spatial element, you know, which I wonder why. Yeah. But in some other cases, it's crucial. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about Masada, you know, mm -hmm. how it yeah. has changed, the weather it has changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll go. On. Yeah. I, I. I. I don't know enough about yeah, that that case to sort of really say. But I think it's it, there. There is difference, and it changes as well. And you know, I didn't have time to go into it, but you know, this pilgrimage has declined with certain conditions in Turkey as well, and that's really changing the 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 national identity and social memory in Australia without this space for imagining an alternative history. And there's a reversion to traditional. Histories that the and the and the uh, institutions which were responsible for prior to the pilgrimage, which shows how it really framed Australia's national identity. More questions, please, John. Um, yeah, thanks, Brad. So how much is this a, a, a tourist, uh, an experience, an experience of collective tourism or something, and how much of it is a, a kind of national experience? And I assume it's somewhere between the two. And if it is, then. How does it get, when does it become national? And, and one empirical question, I guess, would be, 
the, the, the consciousness of this in Australia for people who don't go to Gallipoli. So how mm, you know, yeah. their kind of awareness of it and how they, so what are, how is that kind of becoming national? Going yeah, to so, so it comes, um, so particularly early on, it becomes national when, in the early stages, not by people when they travel there yeah. and had these really heightened emotional experiences, yeah. often which they didn't expect. Yeah. And you know, often you know, I've got these great quotes of people. You know, it's only when people are in Istanbul they realise they saw a poster, yeah. you know, tour a tour of Libya. Oh, that's where Gallipoli is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which shows how much of the, it was imagined previously, which didn't exist in a geographic location. Right? It's just an imagination. Um, um, it's in relation to the narrative changes that affects. Um, so it becomes more popular, more people on word of mouth largely visit this, they tell others, you know, so the tradition emerges from that, um, which makes it more national. Um, those experiences get uh, becoming you know, prominent in the media, uh, but discursively in polit polit political speeches, they talk about you know, being there, um, new emotions about you know, the experience of the past you know, from being there. Um, but you know, there's like, you know, like Ataturk's quote here, Every Anzac Day since 1990, this has been talked about. Uh, the Turks, you know, who were pre previously really not part of the um, historical narrative, become a core part of it. So everyone, you know, who engages with this tradition in Australia, you know, has been affected by the pilgrimage. Yeah. Um, Tony, please. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very interesting case study. And I was especially intrigued by your use of the, your focus on the concept of travel, which I think is very, and pilgrimage basically, it's, pilgrimage is an example of travel. Uh, because it can also be very useful to discussing, and to think about it in terms of performance. And I have a suggestion here, but first I have some informative questions to ask. So the actual people who were traveling on both groups, on both, uh, where they, I, maybe I missed it, what, how are they connected interpersonally? I mean, what were the what, what groups, what kind of groups? Perhaps I miss it in terms of the people. Um, look, uh, there, there are some, you know, organised tours, but largely it's as um, individual, and particularly the backpackers. <coughs> they kind of, you know, they might be travelling with one or two friends, or as individuals. And but pilgrimage has that characteristic to it. Yeah, it's very, you know, traditionally it's a kind of there's an individualism to it. And Victor Turner talks a lot about the distinct characteristics of pilgrimage. You know, and he, he talks about it as one of the, you know, it's a traditional ritual, but it's one that has liminoid characteristics, which is a term that he tradition he normally <coughs> reserves for contemporary rituals. Yeah. Because what I was trying to think, because it, it, for me it's fascinating to think about in terms of this combination. Uh, this, there's a continuum between what I call networks of clubs and the actual, let can say, national performance, as in going to a commemorative place and doing some kind of ritual. And here is a lot, this is what uh, is fine and it's called, associated with call an extended occasion because they go in from Australia and they go in together for, for a long time, a relatively long time, go back. And here it's, it's of course all about explicit nationalism, obviously. So it's interesting in this kind of case study to think about the kind of performance that goes on and the kind of situations of strangers and friends, friends because yeah. in this kind of tour people really turn the tour last yeah. month. So I mean one thing I didn't mention which is really key part of the performance is the Turkish tour guides right. who not only, you know, are a core part of um, providing authentic experience for the the, um, the backpackers and Austra other Australians, but they're the ones that often made up this history. <laughs> you know, they imagine they would, you know imagine some of this history. I mean, other ones, you know, the state was involved, but yeah, they pieced together, you know, bits of uh, Turkish history, you know, bits. And I can tell you, you know, the one person, um, Kanan Chelik, who was you know responsible, one of the original tour guides. You know, who made up a lot of this stuff? He he says, I you know, and you know, he'd studied in the United States, and he had a vested interest in, in in um, the locals not being upset with all these Australians visiting, um, and so he saw himself as a peace ambassador, right? Um, um, and so um, that's core part of the authenticity. But they also, you know, were responsible for a lot of you know the narrative. So again, from a performance perspective, and all these you know different factors. You know, culminating to a successful performance. You know, without them, this may not not have happened, and it probably wouldn't have happened. Um, and now they're becoming marginalised because of the kind of mass tourism in amongst Turks, uh, and and 
and, and other sort of politics. So, uh, yeah. We have time for one more question. Please. I wonder about the process of Australia. You, uh, you showed that there was increasing the interest in the case in the last 20 years, but we also know that during this period in Australia there was a critical perspective uh, to Australia, uh, a history, uh, post colonial thinking. How is this process uh, intervene? Yeah, so there's been a lot, um, so, you know, there's a lot of tension in the relationship between Australia and Turkey. Part of its kind of failings is around the um, Armenian genocide. Um, you know, some of the contestation in Australia around the memory of this um, is also around Indigenous Australians and recognition of it, a recognition of the frontier wars. You know, the invasion of Australia by you know the British, um, and recognition. There's a push to recognise that as a war and be commemorated. Um, and but that's been addressed in some ways that there's been an inclusion of indigenous Australians, Aboriginals within the Anzac memory. Mm. Um, and I'll also just say because I did say to uh, Larry, I, I mentioned this that that um, you know some of the stories, the cosmopolitan stories that, that come from here as part of the performance, you know, is of gift exchange and stories of you know in some places you know the trenches were very close together. And the tour guides tell stories of, you know, sharing of gifts, uh, you know, chocolate, and they say, you know, the Turks never had chocolate before, and they'd send fruit over, and they, you know, some had tobacco and some had like cigarette paper, and they'd throw it and share it, and you know, and I think, you know, to quote the tour guide, you know, uh, these people didn't know what they were there for; they're just there as tourists, like they they they're imagined as tourists wanting to see the world, uh, the Australians. Uh, and, and the two sides didn't hate each other, they were just friends. Now there's the mention of that as we, you know, uh, we've heard, but this is also a particular you know, narration uh, of, um, you know, uh, of, of the war and, and the happenings um, in it. Where now the kind of, is, well, the, you know, the in, more increasingly significant Islamist narrative is of, uh, Gallipoli is a core part of a, a broader holy war. Um, between you know Christianity, you know, it's aligned with the Crusades and you know Christianity versus Islam and so forth. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs>